And one funny anecdote I'll say is that over the years, people have said things about Arcane like, you know, we try to hire some guy, and at the end of the day, he passes on us and he goes somewhere else. And we ask, like, uh, you know, this is uncommon. M most people that come apply to us, they, they really want to work there because they know what kind of game we make. But once in a while, we have someone pass on us. And, and often when we ask them why, it, you know, this is like going back 10 years or whatever, like, why, why didn't you take the job? And they often would say, you know, I'm going to go with EA or whoever because Midway because I feel uh, I need the stability of a big company. And like, Arcane's been around 17 years, and very seldom have we uh, laid anybody off. I don't think we've ever had layoffs in that sense, you know? And big companies are just like, you know, for a while it was like every six months, mass layoff, uh, or closure of a studio in this state or that state. And it's like, I think you really should think through that whole thing about stability in games and like, who's really stable and who's not stable. You've probably heard of Arcane Studios. In 2012, the team entered the spotlight with Dishonored, a game lauded for its fluid blend of stealth, action, first-person mechanics, and the progression of a role-playing game. 2016 saw the release of Dishonored 2, a sequel that took the ideas established in its predecessor and expanded them in nearly every way. It garnered similar critical praise and further developed Arcane's particular style of game. And of course, just recently, Arcane released Prey. And despite its sci-fi aesthetic, it displays the same tenets as the Dishonored series. Experimentation, improvisation, and player choice. But despite Arcane's recent success, it wasn't always a household name. In fact, for most of its history, it toiled in relative obscurity. Its first two games, Arx Fatalis and Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, were well received, but resulted in lackluster sales. Then came a string of promising titles that were later cancelled. Return to Ravenholm, an expansion for Half-Life 2, LMNO, the narrative-focused project with Steven Spielberg, and The Crossing, a genre-blending game much like the ones Arcane would later become known for. And all of this begs the question, why did it take 12 years for the studio to find success? How did so much talent go unrecognized for so long? What is it about Dishonored that finally gave Arcane its time in the limelight? It's this story that brought us here, to Austin, Texas, a bastion for all things weird, an oasis of ideas in a desert of tradition. It was here where Rafael Colantonio opened Arcane's second branch in 2006, with the intent of tapping into the city's development talent. It is, it, it is still a little uh, shocking in a way because I think, uh, I think some, some studios maybe uh, are immediately successful with one game and they go big or you know they have like a lot of funding so they arrive and they they hire like a, a big team and, and so that's not our case we started four people who were uh, very broke for a long time our first game was kind of known in the fans community for this kind of game but it was not successful financially so it was it was a long struggle like everywhere we would go at E3 or anywhere uh, nobody would know us ever uh, and occasionally I would say you know people would I would interest myself and people would say where are you from and so I would say Arcane as uh, occasionally one would say oh yeah yeah but even when they said that I was not sure that it was it was sincere and I've been actually at Arcane now longer than any other job I've had in my entire life. I think I've been at Arcane over eight years now. And I, when I realized that, I was like, wow, that's longer than I was in the Air Force. It's longer than I've had any job. It just feels like games are so volatile. It feels weird to, to think like that. But part of what's made it work is the singular dedication to a particular kind of game that is a hybrid, a first-person shooter and RPG. Like, it's a first-person shooter that doesn't give you the cinematic thrill ride it lets you approach things very slowly at your own pace think about them explore and that's that guiding principle like everybody dedicated to that has made it uh, an amazing fit come on come on hey you got it I think it was only a question of time. I mean, how could the, the, the games keep going trying to emulate movies? For That's not right to me. It's, uh, it, it feels like games are, are best at doing what you just described. They're, they're best at actually putting you in a world and, and where everything is a uh, simulation and then you act on it. Yeah, I've been in games 23 years now and it's like I literally remember times when 
executives from publishers would tell us things like first person games don't sell uh, or the RPG is dead or stealth games nobody wants that and it's it's always amazing because it's like at any given time somebody wants and a large group of people want almost everything, right? If you look at the resurgence of XCOM, a brilliant series, uh, the ongoing success of Civilization, uh, the Elder Scrolls just keeps on rolling, you know, Doom, uh, you know, being a classic and come back to life. Like, if you look at those games, not all of it is nostalgia, some of it is that that pattern really works. It provides a particular media experience that people want. Although they didn't know each other at the time, Cole Antonio and Smith were both QA testers on System Shock, the 1994 game from Looking Glass Studios that would influence a generation of renowned developers. It used overlapping systems to encourage player choice and experimentation, much like Dishonored and Prey. Today, we call this type of game an immersive sim. This was the kind of game Cole Antonio wanted to make when he founded Arcane in 1999. But with larger publishers focusing on sports games and established franchises, funding was hard to find. It was here in Austin where Ion Storm worked on Deus Ex, the legendary title created under the direction of Warren Spector. It followed in the footsteps of Looking Glass Studios and Origin Systems, companies whose games were deep and complex but never sold incredibly well. In many ways, Deus Ex was the last game from the golden age of immersive sims. I remember distinctly like loving uh, first-person action games quite a bit. Like I loved Doom and Half-Life, uh, but I also still really loved those like open-ended RPG like games and I like really wanted somebody to I wanted to play a game that had both of those things together when I eventually met Harvey and was introduced to Ion Storm and saw what they were working on Deus Ex it was like those two things together it's like somebody somebody had combined peanut butter and chocolate for me you know what I mean and I was like this is the thing I want this is the thing I'm talking about but being introduced into that world uh, was pretty fascinating. I came in with, a, you know, I came in with that desire to see that kind of game that I described. But I also came in with some very naive understandings of like, why don't games do story better or whatever? And I know that's still kind of a perennial question. But at the time, I thought I had all the answers already. And then I was like, oh, this is really hard. <laughs> uh, it's it's really hard, especially if you want the player to be telling their own story instead of creating a movie. Traces of immersive sims can be seen in Thief 3, Far Cry 2, and the Bioshock series. Games that kept this style of game alive after the closing of Ion Storm, Looking Glass Studios, and Origin Systems. But for the most part, immersive sims, despite their sophisticated design, faded into the background for almost a decade. And as the members of Arcane tell it, a variety of factors played into this dry period. Uh, it's just that a lot of developers steered away from them either because they, are, they were too hard to make, to cost too much, Devel uh, publishers didn't really believe in them, they never re you know, Publishers tend to have a, uh, if it did not sell in the past, it won't sell in the future, kind of, a, kind, kind of, uh, of thinking. People who don't have the insider information, not about the industry per se, because you have industry analysts of course, but I mean like about what players feel when they play these games, more touchy-feely. Some of the people making those decisions about funding, they, they don't have that. And so they will come to some conclusion based on how many copies of Farmville exist in the world or whatever. And they'll make some funding decisions and like through the gatekeepers it will be hard to get a project going. It, it is possible that the older uh, generation of those games were maybe did not have the amount of uh, marketing that was needed or the amount of, uh, of execution that was needed for truly enjoying those games because there's a minimum bar of execution that people now want in order to really even look at your game. And that's, that's one of the reasons indie games have thrived is that people who were, hit, who were in a position to do so said, you know what, we're not going to take money from anybody, we're just going to go live in my parents' house for eight months, we're going to make this game. Our artist is going to sleep on the couch and the spare bedroom is going to be taken by this programming duo we have and, uh, and they just did it, you know, so that's why all these uh, dead genres have, have not only found new life but they're thriving, they've, they've, they've done interesting things, they've moved the industry forward. After all the uncertainty of the past decade and the looming fear that they were in love with a dead genre, Dishonored's release day crept closer to a nervous Arcane Studios. The team had found trust in publisher Bethesda and had done their best to explain what exactly the game was to an audience who largely forgot what immersive sims could be. But even so, October 9th, 2012 approached like a looming cloud. All Arcane could do was wait. 
the compelling abilities, the bold artistic design, the colorful characters, and above all, the freedom of choice. All of these things make Dishonored a game that demands to be played and replayed. But Dishonored 1 was really like our first breakout for Arcane, and what I think led to that was probably all of the accrued institutional knowledge that the company had. These guys that have been with us for a very long time, and Raph himself, they had just like worked and worked and worked on these immersive first person games, especially with first person melee combat and magic and things like that, and blending narrative with AI behaviors. Uh, so for Bethesda to go with us and, and let us do this thing that has always proven to not really work out very well, it was actually a pretty uh, a bold move that, that I appreciate, uh, that they had trust in us to be able to pull off something like this and make it actually successful. It was a combination of good timing, good team that was finally mature, uh, the publisher that believed in us, put the money that was necessary, and, and, the, and the good marketing eye and understanding of our game. And now we're talking 10 years into the, 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 the life uh, of the studio and, and, and I would wear a t-shirt with, with, with this song on it and people in, in the airport would stop me and say, oh yeah, I've, I've played this game or I love this game, or, I'm waiting for this game. It was, it, was, it was still hard to truly believe that they, they were, <laughs> that it was true, that they were sincere because we had this like, um, uh, this really habit of, uh, of being just, just this tiny company. We've not even come close yet to tapping out the number of people in the world who want to play a particular kind of game. One of my friends in Austin, her mom is interesting. She's 70, and uh, her and her husband used to play games together on university mainframes back in like the 70s, I guess. And um, she, because she knows me, she was like, I want to play this game you made, Dishonored. So she put it on easy, and she never played a stealth game. And she played through the entire game, trying to avoid the combat, looking at the environments, the pseudo-Victorian setting. And she actually finished the game, and she had comments on the lore and the setting and the environmental storytelling. It was really a magical experience, and it made me realize there's a whole audience out there who could enjoy this type of game 